Hi, everyone. So my talk today is about the state of conversational artificial intelligence. And I want to open with a survey of the room. So can you raise your hand if you own an Amazon Echo? Okay, raise your hand. OK, keep them up. Keep them up if you regularly use more than five Alexa skills. Okay. So next, I want you to raise your hand if you've ever called customer service and gotten one of those automated voice responses. OK, yeah? Leave your hand up if you would describe that as a delightful experience. All right, two people. One person thinks it's a delightful experience. So we've been told that chatbots are the new apps, but if you've ever actually used a chatbot, you probably had an experience more like this. So another title for my presentation might be How to Design Conversational Experiences That Don't Suck. The reason I use the word design is that engineers sometimes think that to improve a product, you just need better algorithms, better feature engineering. But the reality is that with the current limits in NLP, your user experience design and your depth of understanding of your customer sometimes is more important than the actual product engineering. So I'm Maria Yao. I am the editor-in-chief of TopBots, which is one of the leading publications for enterprise AI. I'm also the CTO of MetaMaven, which builds AI products focused on revenue growth. We've had the fortune of working with a lot of really great, leading, innovative companies. So normally when I give this talk, it's an hour and a half long. They told me two days ago it's going to be 22 minutes. So you guys get the accelerated and abridged version, starting with use cases for conversational AI. So brand engagement is one of the best and most natural use cases for conversational interfaces. And Disney's Zootopia bot is one of my favorite. This bot was launched after the movie already came out, and Disney wanted to re-engage their audience. So they created this bot where you could talk to Officer Judy Hopp, who's the movie protagonist, help her solve a number of crimes, and then if you succeed, you get this personalized badge that you can share all over social media. So on average, people engage with this bot for 10 minutes, which is a lot longer than anybody watches trailers or looks at display ads. Retail is another great use case for conversational interfaces, and eBay has one of the best because they have a really strong NLP team. So it's able to handle a lot of use cases. But one of the most interesting use cases in retail is actually the post-purchase process. So GameStop used to use SMS and email to notify people when they had ordered a product and when it was expected to be delivered. They had under a 1% engagement rate with those notifications. As soon as they moved to Facebook Messenger, their engagement rate went up to almost 100%. This is because people view SMS as a one-way push from a company to the user, but they view messaging platforms as a two-way conversation. Language learning and other forms of education is also a great use case for conversational interfaces. Duolingo launched bots two years ago. So much easier than trying to coordinate with a real-life language learning partner when you can just learn from a bot. It's a gamified experience, and it even helps you out when you get stuck. Streamlining bureaucratic experiences like registering to vote is also a potential use case for conversational interfaces, as is suing Equifax, a use case that at least 50% of Americans can get behind. So, <laughs> Customer support is another very popular use case for conversational AI, and one of the best case studies is from Autodesk. A few years ago, Autodesk switched from a license model to a SaaS model. It exploded their number of users and also the number of customer support requests, and so they built this customer support bot named Ava. Ava handles 30,000 conversations a month. She handles 40 distinct customer use cases. She cut the average rev resolution time from 38 hours down to 5.4 minutes. And she cut the average cost per case from $15 to $200 to under a dollar. Customer service, though, is a somewhat tricky place to put bots. As you saw from the hands raised and then retracted earlier, <laughs> when people call customer service, they're usually already pissed off. They're frustrated with their brand. They're not very happy with you. That is the worst place to put a terrible bot in front of them. So most customer service use cases that are actually successful use what we call a cyborg model, also known as human in the loop or hybrid. There are tons more use cases across all kinds of industries, functions, and brands. And we've documented a lot of them at topbots.com slash brands. So you can go there and review different bot use cases on your own time. So next, I want to talk about historical architectures and limitations for building dialogue systems. There are five general strategies for building conversational AI. 
Traditionally, you used rule-based or retrieval-based methods. And in fact, if you look for any chatbot production system or vendor, chances are they're going to be using one of these two methodologies. Rule-based. People sometimes forget that text-based interfaces preceded graphical user interfaces. Now, it's hard to think about Microsoft DOS as a, quote, conversational interface because it's so bad. But it is, right? It's an open text interface. It's just bad because there's no guidance. There's no affordance. If you type a command even remotely wrong, it doesn't work. But a rule-based system does not have to suck. Eliza was a chatbot that was developed in the 1960s. It was a rule-based chatbot, came from MIT. It was modeled off of a therapist. There were people who were convinced that she was a real person and would actually request personal sessions with Eliza. Next is retrieval-based. The way retrieval-based systems work is that there's a predefined repository of responses or response templates that a bot could possibly use. And then given a particular user input, you then select the correct response or response template. You can use all kinds of selection methods. So you can use very simple ones like keyword matching, or you could use more advanced approaches like machine learning or deep learning. IBM Watson that won Jeopardy in 2011 is an example of a retrieval-based system. The research project behind IBM Watson was called Deep QA, and it was actually quite an impressive feat of engineering. Sadly, it was decommissioned shortly after IBM won um, Jeopardy, and it actually has nothing to do with what's currently marketed as IBM Watson APIs today. Traditional dialogue systems are built step by step, meaning there's a lot of pre-processing steps, there's a lot of custom application logic, and there's a lot of custom function functionality that has to be built by software developers. This causes a problem because you usually need, need domain experts to build a system. The knowledge base that you use is hard-coded, so it becomes outdated and requires manual updating. That makes it very hard to adapt to new domains, languages, and use cases. And of course, it's difficult to scale and personalize. So given the limitations of historical architectures, there's been a lot of recent research to try to overcome them. One of these is generative methods. In generative methods, you don't have a predefined repository of possible answers. You actually generate an answer from scratch using different machine learning approaches. The idea here is you should be able to develop a model end to end rather than step by step so that you can build your model based only on training data rather than any manual feature engineering or any domain expertise. So there's three different ways to do generative and then you can also combine all of them to improve your performance. So the first is, of course, supervised learning. Conversation can be modeled as a sequence-to-sequence -sequence problem, where you have your user input, your user sentence as an input, and then your output is your computer-generated response. The challenge with sequence-to-sequence -sequence models is that if you're using some form of maximum likelihood estimation as your cost function, it tends to prioritize high probability and high frequency responses. So something like, I don't know. I don't know is an acceptable answer to a lot of questions. It's just not very useful, interesting, or engaging. Another challenge is that these kinds of systems have difficulty generating contentful words. Proper nouns tend to be relatively rare in training data, so they don't get picked up in the model. And finally, these kinds of systems can get stuck in repetitive loops, where they just say, I don't know, over and over and over again. So typically, people will augment supervised learning with reinforcement learning. The way they do this is a two-stage training. So first, they bootstrap a conversational model with supervised learning, and then they try to use reinforcement learning to get that particular conversational agent to be able to adapt to new circumstances that may not have existed in the actual training data. Finally, there's adversarial learning. Adversarial learning is basically the Turing test, where you have a generator that generates a computer response, and then a discriminator that has to disambiguate between a real human dialogue or a computer-generated dialogue. In some research, it's been shown that adding adversarial learning on top of a regular sequence-to-sequence -sequence model can improve performance. Now, personally, I don't recommend adversarial learning for production. If you have ever seen grown men argue with each other on Twitter, it should be self-evident that human-level conversation is not necessarily sufficient for being productive. <laughs> and it may not necessarily be the gold standard that you want to train your machines on. So when someone brags to you and says, I have a state-of-the-art conversational AI system, what do they actually mean? Generally speaking, they're using some kind of ensemble approach where they're using a mix of rule-based, retrieval-based, and generative methods. 
One example of this is Amazon's Alexa Prize. So the Alexa Prize was a challenge for university teams to create a general social chit-chat bot, meaning a bot that can talk about anything, which is a very, very difficult technical challenge. So the best teams would use ensemble methods where they might use a rule-based system to tell you jokes, a retrieval-based system to tell you news, and maybe a generative system to handle other use cases. The most advanced of these would use hierarchical reinforcement learning, where you have a low-level policy that handles the task at hand, and then a higher-level policy that handles either model selection or some other strategic goal. How well do these fancy AI systems work? Based on the two-star review on Amazon, maybe not so well. <laughs> Something to keep in mind, though, is that we are very much still at the beginning of creating really great artifi artificial intelligence conversational agents. Just like websites at the beginning of the internet sucked, so do chatbots today, but that doesn't mean that they won't get better. Another approach is grounded learning. Consider this sentence. I took the milk and the coffee out of the fridge and I poured one into the other. Did I pour the milk into the coffee or the coffee into the milk? The answer to that question isn't actually contained in the sentence, but you, because you have real world knowledge, you would guess that I poured a small amount of the milk into a large amount of the coffee. As a more discreet example, let's say a user says to an agent, I'm going to Kusakabe tonight. A vanilla sequence to sequence neural network model might say something generic like, have a great time. But what you really want, what you really find valuable is something much more specific, like what a human would say. Oh, you're gonna love it. They have the best omakase in town. Traditional dialogue models are all grounded. IBM Watson used four terabytes of external data to support its decision making. Neural network models, however, because they're, they need to be completely differentiable if you want to train them end to end, it becomes a little bit trickier to encapsulate external knowledge base and real world knowledge into them. But there are a lot of interesting approaches. So let's say, for example, you have all tabular data. You want to ask a question like, what rivers are in South Carolina? What you could do is train a sequence to sequence model that maps a user input to an API query or a SQL query or some kind of functional call. The problem, though, is that the vast majority of enterprise data is not structured. It's in the form of images, it's in the form of unstructured text, and so asking something like, what color is this necktie, is a non-trivial problem to solve. And what if you had a question that actually involved reasoning? In this case, is there a red shape above a circle? That requires a couple of logical steps to answer correctly. So there's a lot of interesting research approaches to these complicated multimodal Q&A systems, but one of the ones I find quite interesting is what you would call modular neural network architectures. So in this particular case, you train a little neural network that understands one or two concepts. So a neural network that understands the concept of red, a neural network that understands the concept of above, and then as you parse this input sentence, you generate a larger neural network on the fly that is customized to this particular sentence. And it does work for somewhat complicated sentences. So I personally find this sentence a little bit confusing, and I have human-level intelligence, but this particular system is able to answer it. But there's still so many problems and challenges that face especially multimodal conversational agents. As an example, here's an ad from Southern Comfort, which is a liquor brand. This ad says, next door, they used to have a poodle. What happened to the poodle? The alligator ate the poodle. There's not a single AI-based visual Q&A system that can understand this ad. I put it through a bunch of popular vision APIs, and a lot of the APIs don't even recognize it's an advertisement. They just see the literal objects that are in the image. The challenge is that within language, there's a lot of layers, right? The first layer is syntax, which is, did you say something grammatical? Did you say something that makes sense? The next level is semantics, which is what is the literal thing you're trying to say? In this case, the literal thing this ad is trying to say is, my alligator ate my next door neighbor's poodle. But then there's a level above that called pragmatics, which is what is the purpose of your communication? Why are you saying what you're saying? In this case, the purpose of this ad is to say, you should buy more Southern Comfort. Another thing to analyze is why is this ad funny? Because what makes it funny is what makes it challenging for AI. So the first thing is that there's a curiosity gap, meaning you have to figure out what happened yourself. This ad would be a lot less funny if it just said, my alligator ate the next door neighbor's poodle, and it didn't leave anything to your imagination. Another thing is that alligators don't usually eat poodles, so it's kind of a surprise. And you can see why this could be a challenge for machine learning systems, because it's not going to show up in training corpuses. 
And the final thing is denotation versus connotation. So the dictionary, dictionary definition of a poodle is a dog with curly hair. But really, when you think of poodle, you're thinking something like this. So it's so much funnier that it ate a poodle. What if the ad said, next door there used to be a collie? Then you'd be like, oh my god, they ate Lassie. And it wouldn't be a funny ad anymore. So how you think about concepts, there's always going to be a literal definition, but then also a lot of personal mental models and connotations you develop. So the dictionary definition of McDonald's is it's a global fast food chain that sells hamburgers. But every single one of you has a different mental model of what McDonald's actually is. Maybe you remember pleasant childhood memories of getting Happy Meals and Happy Meal toys. Maybe you made poor dietary decisions when you were in college. Maybe you remember all the ads that they keep putting in front of you. Maybe you've actually used their mobile app or their digital experiences. Maybe you have some strong opinions about the mascots or the celebrities that they hire. Or maybe you're just a troll and all you focus on is their PR disasters. Brands spend billions and billions of dollars every year to affect your mental model of them. And if you think about it, they do this through a multi-sensory, multi-modal, multi-touch experience for a very long time. And that's actually how you learn anything. Which brings me to the last approach, which is interactive learning. If you think about how language evolved naturally, it evolved because human beings needed to cooperate with each other in order to solve problems, and they used language as a vehicle for cooperation. So why not teach computers in a cooperative problem-solving format? So unfortunately, I don't have much time, so I'm not going to go into detail, but I will leave you with this provocative quote by Percy Liang, who works on this at Stanford. He says, how do we represent knowledge, context, memory? Maybe we shouldn't be focused on creating better models, but rather better environments for interactive learning. So I do have a longer version of this presentation that's available at mariayao.com slash convo AI, where I go into greater detail on different approaches in interactive learning and what we can learn about that for conversational agents. So to end the presentation, I want to go over one major design principle which is expect the unexpected. As an illustration of this principle, I want to talk about a bot that we made um, for our website. So our website, TopBots, has a lot of educational material. Some of it's technical, some of it's business focused. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to create a bot that helps users find the content that they want? So we created a bot named Body McBotface, your friendly TopBots concierge. And he just sits on the website, and you can say, Body, I'm looking for AI for customer service, I'm looking for AI for marketing, and Body would give you articles and white papers and videos to watch. So I know there was a lot of backlash recently about Google Duplex not outing itself as a bot. This bot's called Body McBotface. I don't know how much more obviously you can out yourself as a bot. Yet, notice how strangely people still behave with him. They still treat him like he's human. This is an example of someone who took a didactic approach with Body. This person felt the need to write paragraphs and paragraphs of information, bragging to Body about how much they knew about NLP and dialogue systems. This person asked Body for professional career advice. So that's a little bit more normal, because this is on an AI company website. And we actually even had people who would paste TensorFlow code in to the chat window and ask Body to debug it. But, <laughs> But this was a kind of more typical, right? You might expect that people would ask about like, AI careers, help with AI. So that was about 5% of our total users. And then we had people like Harley. Harley says, Body, I am looking for love. <laughs> and he proceeded to complain to Body about various travails he experienced trying to find himself a girlfriend. And then we have Michelle. Michelle says, Body, I'm looking for erotic chatbots. What percentage of users do you think asked romantic questions? 15%. So three times more users talked to Body about their various romantic problems than asked Body advice about AI, which was his purpose. So just keep in mind, that's really strange. And then what we had to do was come up with a disclaimer page. So on our disclaimer page, it just says Body can help you find content on top bots. Body cannot debug either your TensorFlow code or your romantic life. So keep that in mind. Like People always do very, very strange things with bots, whether or not you disclose their bots or not. There's plenty more, but unfortunately, I'm out of time. So again, if you want to see a longer version of this presentation, it's at mariayao.com slash convoai. There's a couple other resources I can recommend as well. So first, 
Our website, TopBots, has a lot of information about AI for enterprise, but we have a lot especially focused on customer service automation, building conversational AI, and NLP approaches. I also started a Facebook group that's for executives to get together and exchange information. So we regularly post content. If you have questions, you can also post in the group and get it answered. And then finally, I have a book, Applied Artificial Intelligence, a handbook for business leaders. This book was inspired by our work with Fortune 500 companies where we realized there was a huge gap of knowledge um, in decision makers who are actually deciding how to invest in AI and what kind of AI to build. So we wrote this book as a basic primer, kind of a AI 101 for business executives. So you can download a preview copy at appliedaibook.com, but I'm also outside doing book signings at 3 p.m. H2O was nice enough to buy copies for all of you, so they are complimentary. So you can come find me outside afterwards. But thank you for listening, and if you have any questions or comments, you can email me at maria.topbox.com. At